here at Malden. We're so glad you took the time out of your day to come and worship with us. It's good to see some people I haven't seen in a while. They probably haven't seen me either. It's good to see Rick and, and Deborah and Miss Ruth. It's good to see uh, all of you here this morning. I have just a few small announcements that most of them are coming out of the bulletin. If you are visiting with us today, we want you to know that you are our honored guest. We want you to complete an attendance card so that we may have a record of your visit. I ask that you come back each and every chance that you can. <coughs> I want everybody to know this is uh, something new that we have going on, that our, uh, our services are now live on Facebook at Malden Church. If for any reason you can't be here, at the service, you can watch it live. Pretty awesome. Uh, they are on a delay on YouTube at Malden Church. I'm not quite sure what that means. Maybe you can watch it anytime you want. Not sure what that means. Get with Joel, I'm sure he will know that. We will want uh, to wish happy birthdays to, to Caitlin Luttrell, who's not with us, but uh, to Rhonda Johnson. I want to wish you a happy birthday uh, for July 5th. I hope you have a super day. It's also good to see you here. I haven't seen you in a few weeks. Glad to see you. I also want everyone to know that uh, Edgewood Church of Christ is having their Bible study on the 18th through, through the 20th. So kids, get on your mother and father. Get signed up for that. We'd also like to thank uh, Sister Pam for this month's bulletins here in July. We're thankful for the ladies that are preparing our bulletins. There's a lot of great information in those. I also have a, uh, a letter here from Sandra DeMorris. Uh, she called to say that her daughter Carla come home from the hospital on Wednesday. Carla's five-year-old granddaughter, granddaughter Brina, fell yesterday on the playground slide. She has a small fracture to her skull and a severe concussion. So they are requesting our prayers. That's all the announcements that we have this morning. In this morning's worship service, Brother Joel Foster will be leading our song service. Uh, Brother Rick Clark will be having our scripture reading. And Brother Vernon Johnson will, will close our service in prayer. 
when we are done. And if you would bow with me, uh, we'll get started. And I'll open this in prayer. Almighty God and our Father who art in heaven, that'll be the great and holy name. Father, we come in prayer this morning with joy and peace and love in our hearts. Thanking you, Father, for this beautiful Lord's Day that you have set before us. This time you have afforded us to come together with our Christian brothers and sisters, this group of believers, to worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, to hear another portion of that divine word, and to gather around the table to remember the great sacrifice given to us by Jesus. We're so thankful, Father, for your word and the truth that we can find in it. And we do know, Lord, if we continue to study it and apply it to our life, that we will have that almighty and uh, home in heaven with you when that day comes. Dear Lord, we are thankful for each and every member and, and, and visitor that has shown that has shown here today for this worship service, and we do pray that for your blessings on each and every one and their families who are here today. We thank the Father for this church that meets here in Malden, and we pray, Lord, that the truth will always be taught here. We also pray, Father, for Brother Dennis this morning. We pray that he may have a ready recollection of the lesson that he has prepared this week. We pray that he will be able to deliver it in a way that we can understand it and more importantly apply what we hear to our lives so that we can continue to grow as Christians and we may be able to teach others of your love and, and of your, your word. We do pray, Father, tonight, uh, this morning, Father, for, for those of our number who are unable to be here. Father, for those who may be sick this hour, those who are shut in that are unable to come out. We pray, Father, for those who are taken care of, those who are shut in as well. And we pray that they would continue to look for your word, for the comfort that they need to keep on going. Dear Lord, we pray for the family member who's who has lost loved ones uh, this week or last week. We pray that they would also look to your word for the comfort they need. We pray, Father, for those who may be working today or those who may be traveling we pray that they would be able to come the next time the next point of time and we also pray father this morning for those who are who are sin sick we, we pray that the, that they would change the air of their ways and something would be said or done in their lives that they would come to your full father before before it is eternally too late it is our prayer father that all come to your fold and all have that eternal life with you in heaven one day. Lord, we also pray at this time for our, our local and state governments and our federal governments. We pray that as they continue making laws that affect your children, that, that you would overcome the laws that, that are contrary to, to your word. Dear Lord, we know that there's great falling away in this country and we just pray that we can get back on track, Father, or even better yet, that Jesus would come back sooner. We are thankful again, Father, for this opportunity we have. We pray that all that is said and done in this service this morning is according to your will and pleasing in your sight. And Lord, we pray for your forgiveness when we fall short of being the Christians that you expect us to be. And this prayer we ask is in the loving and strong name of Christ this morning. Amen. Brother Joel. <laughs> He will 
God will take care of you. When dangers fish your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every Supper nine seven eight nine seven eight. These things did Thomas count as real. The warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the grain of wood, the heft of stone, the last frail twitch of flesh and bone, the vision of table this morning take the bread and the fruit of the vine let's all place our thoughts upon Christ as he hung and died upon that cross for each and every one of us if you would I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 11 23 through 26 
It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. <coughs> well, now I have a prayer for the bread. Now we'll continue in prayer for the food of mine. Our kind of heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to take this food of mine, which represents the shed blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we be taking this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of the Lord's service is giving back to the Lord as he is 
Bible for the blessed sakes on every one of us will. If you would, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now concerning the collections for the saints, as I have given order to the church of the Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. I know how to pray for all. Our kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have that we can give back a portion of you that you bountifully blessed each and every one of us with. We pray as we give back with this on a matter that is pleasing and cheerful in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Two, seven, four. <coughs> Two, seven, four. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, and him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs have taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Eight, eight, three. Eight, eight, three. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah. 
Ask and it shall be given unto you. Sing and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you.
scripture reading this morning is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did not eat nothing, and we never ended, he afterward hungered. Joel, you wouldn't need that cane if you were able. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm so good. Matthew chapter 3. We have Jesus leaving Galilee and makes his way down to the Jordan River for the express purpose of being baptized by John. But after he was baptized, verses 16 and 17 of Matthew chapter 3, Four, or three says that and when he was baptized immediately he went up from the water and behold the heavens opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him and behold a voice from heaven said this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased how many times have we told our children how pleased we are of them Maybe we we're pleased because of what they accomplished. Maybe we're pleased because of the heart that they display. Or maybe we're pleased because they have overcome some insurmountable challenge in their lives. As parents, as grandparents, we do our very best to encourage our children to do their best. When their children are out on their own, try to encourage them by letting them know how much they are loved and how pleased we are with them. This is the kind of encouragement that God gave his son. In essence, God was saying in these verses, son, I love you and I am pleased with your obedience. We'll be looking in Matthew chapter 4 and also Luke chapter 4. Mark is the only one that makes mention of the temptation, but he only does it with two verses. The difference between Matthew and Mark is a little bit of when the temptation came into play. But it tells us that Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. The wilderness, this barren and desolate place, most likely it was a place where there was no fresh water, probably just stagnant pools of water here and there. There was no life-giving plants. A place of rocky hills, dark caves. But more importantly, it was a place of incredible loneliness. Jesus didn't have the support of his family. He had yet to name his disciples so they didn't have a play in this. He didn't bring any food with him. All that he had was the memory of his father and God's voice of approval. This was where Jesus was led for a six-week, 40-day crash course in human suffering. It is here that he was tempted by Satan. There are many tactics that Satan uses to get his claws into us. And we're going to look at just a few of those. Because chances are that this is how he may have gotten us at one time or another. But if you'll notice, when he tried to get his hooks into Jesus, he did it at Jesus' weakest moments. In verses 2 and 3 of Matthew chapter 4, it says that after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, 
If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Have you ever been that hungry? Have you ever been so hungry that you were willing to do anything for food? Satan just didn't pop up here after 40 days. Satan has been lurking in the shadows this whole time, waiting for just such a moment. He was biding his time. And Satan has Jesus right now exactly where he wants him, in a hostile environment, in a lonely and foreboding place. That is exactly where Satan looks for moments like that in our lives. But you notice that Jesus' greatest temptations came after his greatest moment to this point. Jesus is on that spiritual high, being baptized, obeying his Father getting God's seal of approval. But this is not a new trick for Satan. Imagine, if you will, you've heard probably one of the greatest lessons you've ever heard in your life, and you left the church building, and you are on this spiritual high. That you can tackle anything then Monday rolls around and you go to work and it's like the sky has fallen over the weekend at work you come crashing down from that spiritual high Satan used the same trick on Elijah after Elijah's victory over the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel we can read that account in 1 Kings chapter 17. But if you were beginning in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, you'll notice that Jezebel, when she heard of that, wanted that man dead. She wanted to do even worse things to him than he did for the prophets of Baal. And Elijah went into the wilderness. Depression and doubt overcame him. In 1 Kings 18 and verse 4, it says that Elijah begged God to take his life. And even today, Satan picks these times to strike at us and to test us. God has created us for relationships and fellowship. It's when we are separated from these environments that we are the most vulnerable. When we are together, we have a tremendous amount of influence over one another. But it is when we are alone when most of the trouble comes. Think about the prodigal son. He didn't sin in his father's house. It wasn't until he got into this faraway land when he was outside of the influence of his family that he fall. Peer pressure can be one of two things. It can be a powerful deterrent to temptation or it can lead us to temptation, depending on what peers we listen to. Here's Jesus all alone. And Satan slithers in. Have you ever been so tired that you don't know why you do some things? Have you ever wondered why Satan waited until Jesus was in the most weakened state that he's ever been in? 
Now think for a moment. You had a really hard, long day at work and you go home. What is it you want? Peace and quiet. But you haven't seen your little ones all day long and what do they want? Attention. It takes tremendous amount of strength to give them the attention they demand when you are at your weakest moment and when you are most tired. Satan knows when we're sick. He knows when we are disappointed. He knows when we are under mental stress and when we're tired. He also knows that that is the most ideal time because we're ill-prepared and least likely able to resist. This point is brought to light in Mark chapter 14. Jesus telling his disciples in verse 38 to watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. It says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh. Paul tells him that, tells us that it was a satanic tool that was used to harass him. When we think about the early church, persecution was their wilderness. What is our wilderness? The first temptation concerns Jesus' relief from physical hunger. I guess you could say this was probably a challenge of appetites. What appetite do we have that's stronger than another? Jesus was really, really hungry. He could have turned those stones to bread. He could have probably filled up hundreds of thousands of grocery stores with bread with all those stones that was around. And it would be reasonable enough for Jesus to accept what Satan was offering because God did not provide an answer to Jesus' dilemma. There's a common saying in our culture today it's a saying that can't be found in the Bible, but people treat it as if it's a biblical expression. Take things into your own hands. God helps those who help themselves. See, that's not in the Bible. As a matter of fact, God would never say anything like that. The opposite is true. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, verse 33. Friends, if God is willing to go out here and care for these birds that fly around, for all of our flowers, trees, and grass that grows, if God is willing to take care of them, don't you think he's willing to take care of us too? Satan ever whispered to you to look out for number one? Take care of yourself first? When you get on an airplane and you're flying and they're giving you instructions, what do they tell you when the masks drop out of the thing? Put it on your face first. I'm sorry, but if my grandkids and kids are sitting next to me, I'm going to make sure they're breathing first. Oh, hopefully they'll see what I did to them and they can do it to me. <laughs> but to this temptation, Jesus takes us back to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. A man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now I want to switch over to Luke chapter 4. Because <clears throat> this is one of the temptations that's out of order with the other. I don't know why it is, but it's two men writing two different books and they get to write whatever they want to write first. It's the only example of reason I got. 
But this second temptation in Luke 4 was a challenge to worldly power. It is an appeal to Jesus for the lust of the eyes. It tells us that Satan took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of earth. And then Satan tells Jesus that I'll give you all of these if you'll bow down and worship me. How many today would give in to this promise? I can safely say there's probably many that would give in to this temptation. Now, years ago when my son was teaching high school history, every January he would take a group of children to high school students to Washington, D.C. And the students would spend three or four days in seminars and classes and things of this nature, but they would tour the Capitol. And my son come back, I think, from his, I believe it was the first or second time he came back, and he said, Dad, you can smell power in the Capitol building. You can smell power. Many are willing to give in to that temptation. For us, maybe we're willing to do something in order to have material things that we don't really need or we really can't afford. Maybe it is the political power that it seems that place smells of that people like so much. Or maybe it's something that makes us look good. A woman was trying on dresses and Satan says, you look good in that dress. And the woman replied, get behind me, Satan. And he goes around and he says, well, you look good back here too. <laughs> See, it's not enough. Sin is appealing. It feels good. It is a challenge to gain worldly possessions. But like Jesus, we have to say and we must mean it. Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. The third temptation that Jesus faced was about worldly fame and proof of his credibility. This is about replacing faith with proof. The Jews had a tradition at the time of Jesus that the Messiah would miraculously appear at the top of the temple. And it is here that Jesus was taken by Satan to the pinnacle, the top of the temple. And then he told Jesus to throw himself down. It was there that Satan quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Yeah, Satan can quote scripture too. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands will they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Imagine the scenario. Everybody's watching. Even the religious leaders of Jesus' of day would be seeing this. They would see their tradition come true. And Jesus would have been proclaimed the instant Messiah. In a single act, Jesus would convict and convince everyone that he was the son of God. He would win over every skeptic. He would remove the need for faith and replace it with proof. The downside is it was this would remove forgiveness and salvation from Christ from his coming because we are saved by grace 
through faith. It is faith that makes us children of God. It is faith that makes us pleasing to God. If we remove the faith, where are we? Jesus resisted. And this round of temptation came to an end. Satan was going to leave and wait for a better time. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 4, it says that Satan departed from him until a more opportune time. Satan doesn't give up. He just looks for a better opening. He's just waiting around if he can catch us at a weaker moment. A time when we are more vulnerable. See, from the time we get to that age where we understand right and wrong and we can make those choices, Satan is going to be battling us every day. He's going to be battling us every day. He is going to wait because friends we're going to get sick we're going to get depressed we're going to get hungry we're going to be in places where our backs are up against the wall that's where he's waiting in order to deal with this we need to understand and know our enemy the first rule of combat is to never underestimate your opponent. Satan is real. Some believe that he is just a personification of evil. That is just a power or an influence to do evil. But the Bible makes it very clear that Satan is a real person. The Bible refers to him as he, him, and his. He has the attributes of a person. In Genesis chapter 3, he reasoned with Eve. In Job chapter 1 and 2, he talked with God about Job. Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He talks and reasons with Jesus. He lies and he deceives and he's always working. We are easily overcome when we do not have the proper concept of our enemy and his potential. while we need to know our enemy, we also need to know ourselves and our own limitations and weaknesses. Paul has a five-letter word that describes our weaknesses. F-L-E-S-H. Flesh. As long as we are housed in this body, our fleshly desires tug at us. Desires are not wrong. But Satan uses our fleshly desires to tempt us to live outside the boundaries that God has placed on them and their use. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 17 through 20, Paul tells us that the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and that the spirit is against the flesh for they're in opposition to one another. And then, then Paul he starts listing all of these fleshly things. And it's an ugly list. But every one in this list is something that we are capable of doing. We recognize them as attitudes and behaviors that are part of everyday life. 
just like Paul. We are in a constant struggle to deal with attitudes and behavior. I don't know how Paul was able to write what he did in Romans 7. But he laid some things out in verses 22 through 24 that many people try to hide. And you would think that this would never happen to one of the greatest apostles that ever walked the earth. One of the greatest missionaries ever to live. But he said, I delight in the law of the Lord in my inner being, but in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul was tempted too. And from what I gather from these verses, that sometimes he fell into that temptation. And then he says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see, knowing our enemy is not enough, we must also know ourselves. You see, sin is a personal choice. No one makes a sin. And no one has to. We can do that which is fine by ourselves. It's not a disease. It's not a genetic defect. It is not something that we can't control. We can't. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, Paul said that we need to discipline ourselves. The King James, Paul would say, I buffet my body daily. I beat it daily. I remind myself of my weaknesses and I forced myself to stay strong. Not a single one of us in here wants to be disqualified for the prize that's been offered. But we must realize that every sin has its consequences. And one of the greatest deterrents to sin is the fear of punishment. You know, we look at the rising crime rates in some of our great cities of this country. And what we find the rise is, is a lack of punishment. A slap on the wrist and go my own way. Sometimes not even paying any bond or bail. What kept it under control for so long was the fear of punishment. Now some don't fear it, but others do keeps honest people honest. We may get away with that sin for a while, but it's going to have a way of coming back in a But the good news is, is that God is bigger than all our sins. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, God promises that we will not be tempted beyond that which we can endure. Friends, the stronger we are, the more we have to endure. The more faithful we are, the more obedient we are to the gospel, the stronger the temptation. Strong Jesus was. Satan wasn't going easy on him. And Satan thought he got the last laugh when he had him killed on that cross. Deliverance from evil is not automatic. <clears throat> Friends, we have to search for it. When God promises a way out of the temptation, he's not going to put us in a blind alley with a group of people behind us that we can't get out, and sin is the only place we can go. He's going to get us a clear path out of it. We just have to take it. When I was eight years old, my mom and dad 
paid for me and my brother to have swimming lessons. And all that week, we were hanging on the side of the pool, doing the doggy paddle and things like this, in shallow water. In order to move up, you had to go to the 12 foot end and jump in. No can do. Can't do that. Can't do that. And they finally got me to jump in. And I went straight to the bottom. And I didn't take a breath before I jumped either. So there I was walking on the bottom trying to get up. I finally learned when I finally overcame my fear of diving boards. It was just run till you get to the end and jump. By then it's too late. We can't allow Satan to push us. We can't allow him to get a grip on us. To push us in water that's over our head with a chance of coming down on our own. But God can get us out of that. We just have to make the steps to do it. Where do you stand this morning? Has Satan been pestering you? Has he been knocking on your door? Satan wants everybody in here. That's his goal. He wants us all. And for those who have not obeyed the gospel, you're right exactly where he wants you to be. We want to give you a chance to stop him in his tracks. Have the sins that you have committed in your life washed away. Start with a clean slate. Stay in the fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ so that together we can lift and hold each other up and protect one another. And through that positive peer pressure, we can resist the devil. Through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism, you can begin a new life today. Maybe you are a child of God, and maybe you've been called in these weak moments, and you need to repent of those. Now is the opportune time to do that. If it is between you and God himself, go to him in prayer. But if it's something you need to be done in a public way, we ask that you come as together we stand and we sing. <coughs> I bring my sins to Thee, the sins I cannot count, that all may cleanse and be in Thy once open found. I bring them, Savior, all to Thee. The burden.
see everyone that's here this morning with us. We encourage you to be back this evening at 5 for our evening worship. Hope that everyone will have a safe and happy 4th of July. If you get into the fireworks, be careful with it when you're doing that. At this time, we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for all the many blessings of life that you've given to us. Father, we're truly thankful for our homes and our families, our jobs and our income. We're so thankful, Father, for this great country that we live in. We're so thankful for all the freedoms and the, that we have, Father, here in this country. We pray, Father, that you'll be with the government, all the ones who are in leadership, and make the right decisions for our country. Father, we're truly thankful for each and every person here today, and uh, each family that's represented here. Pray that you bless each one, Father. Watch over them and take care of them. Father, help those that have been uh, sick, those that have been in the hospitals, those that have some surgery, and all those that have been listed in our bulletin, Father. Pray that you bless each one, Father, and help them in the ways that you know they need help, Father. We're so thankful, Father, for uh, for Jesus and for him uh, going to the cross in our stead, giving his life there, shedding his blood, giving us all hopes of everlasting life in heaven someday. Father, we're so thankful for this great sacrifice that Christ has made for all mankind. Father, we pray also for those who have not obeyed the gospel this morning, those that are here this morning, Father, that have not obeyed. We pray, Father, that something has been said this morning that will cause them to make things right with thee, Father. Father, we pray also for those who have also been, been uh, uh, saved, been baptized, and they have fallen away, Father. We have a lot of people who have fallen away, and we pray, Father, for them that they'll see the error of their ways and that they'll make things right with Father, continue to be with us and watch over us and uh, uh, give us all a safe trip back to our homes, Father. We ask all these things, Father, to be thy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>